Anyway, anyway, it is really good to be here with you. Uh, I've had an opportunity to to work with college students, um, be there uh, in Fayetteville for for a couple of years now. Um, it's it's phenomenal just to be able to see the opportunities that we have on that campus. Uh, many of you, you know that uh, we we've got a couple different you know I know alumni and people who have. Um, done a lot um, for our campus ministry here within this church. Uh, it's exciting for me during the summertime for me to be able to give it some time to, to go speak to some different churches and be some different places. Uh, but one of the things is to, of course, and, and one of my main purposes in coming to Bethel this morning is to say thank you. Um, because we, I know us being an hour and a half away, uh, you don't always get to see the fruit um, of, of your giving, um, but we get to do what we get to do on the campus. Uh, I get to make disciples on the campus. We get an opportunity to to help college students try to figure out what it looks like to live out their Christian faith. Uh, I get to do that because of churches like you, uh, because of individuals and churches who who give to us and allow us to be able to be there. And so uh, I thank you for for allowing me to be on the mission field there. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about kind of specifically. Uh, what we do maybe toward the end, um, but I'm kind of excited about being able to speak to you this morning, and so i um, got, got a message that I want to share with you, and, and, and a big part of that is, uh, is stories, um, and just kind of, so a little bit about who I am, and, and Brother Dylan was able to share that a little bit. Uh, Karen and I have been married 11 years, um, and so it's, uh, it's just been, it's been a wild ride. It's crazy. Uh, I've got three kids. Uh, anybody in the house got three or more? Um, so we talked to several people, right, who, you know, just asked them about three kids. And they said, oh, it's not that bad. They lied to us. <laughs> it is ridiculous. And so anybody who's got two thinking about the third, you may, uh, as far as I know, you might as well have twins. Um, because four in Dabble is not that bad. But three is terrible. Um, <laughs> no, we love our kids greatly, but uh, it is, there's always something. Um, it, it's always, it's always, always, always something. And so, um, it, it's crazy, but, but one of the things that I'm learning, God's refining in me, sanctifying through me, I guess, whatever you want to say it, um, is that it, it's a, it's an honor to be able to, to live life in ministry and, and have students in and through our house, um, to, to be able to, you know, there's times where I feel like it's chaotic and crazy, um, but the opportunity to bring kids into our students into our house and, and have them right alongside of our family. I'm, I'm constantly reminded of how many of them, um, they're comforted by that, uh, and maybe a little bit of our mess and the messiness of life, uh, as far as raising children and trying to live out our Christian faith, uh, being able to just bring them right alongside of it. And so a lot of Karen and I and our ministry and what we try to do, um, that kind of, kind of permeates a lot of it. Um, but anyway, uh, as far as growing up, I did. I grew up in southeast Arkansas, actually in DeWitt um, is where I, I grew up. And, and I, my, my folks weren't really from there, uh, but Dad took an insurance job when I was a baby um, down that direction. And so, man, we had, a, had an insurance agency for, for, you know, while I was growing up. And Dad was an entrepreneur, and so he was always doing something. But at one particular time, we had a laundromat and some rental houses and some other stuff. And so there was always something to be done and work to be done and that kind of thing. Um, but I really thought that I grew up with a pretty tame, mild story. Both my parents loved each other. Mom worked with Dad and sold insurance. And, of course, with the management, anybody who has rental property or laundromat, that kind of stuff, you know, there's way more work than needs to be done to be done. Um, and so just a lot, of, a lot of that kind of stuff. But, but folks loved each other raised in a in church and and going to church and grandparents went to church that kind of thing and so I even remember at different points in time thinking my story is really not that interesting um I remember different people coming and sharing testimonies and t and sharing that kind of stuff and it's just you know I'm story's pretty boring um and, and <laughs> let me just any of those of you who are are younger and you, and you ever have that thought like my story's not that interesting I don't have a lot to tell let me just really encourage you. Hang on. Um, just hang on. Um, because if you'll be faithful to God, he will tell a story through you, and I promise you that. Um, he, he will use you um, to, to speak in and through people. You don't have to cause any extra uh, drama to happen within your life because I promise you just live life long enough and there's a story to tell. Um, but anyhow, uh, as I grew up, uh, I kind of went to college. Uh, it definitely had some, college was in a big influential time period in my life. 
Um, big, a lot, a lot of changes happening. Uh, did a lot of waffling back and forth throughout that that high school time period, as many people do. And um, but I got around some some Christian people and had had a big repentance moments, kind of headed into college. Um, that changed changed a lot of who I was. And so I walked into college eager and ready to follow after Christ, not ready to run. Uh, except for this time, I really wanted it to be serious because I had kind of done the whole game of playing back and forth. And uh, God blessed me with being at a small university um, and being around some people um, who, who followed after Christ and showed me what it looked like to, to trust in Christ on Tuesday, you know, if that makes sense. Um, what it looked like more than just a Sunday morning relationship or a Wednesday or, um, you know, a, a church camp or, you know, conference or something like that. And so it was a, it was a huge blessing. And, and probably one of the biggest turns in my story that I didn't, uh, man, I never would have expected, uh, and most people, you never would. Uh, when I was about 23 years old, um, I found out that I had an older sister. Um, so surprise, surprise, that's quite uh, scandalous um, part of a story. Um, uh, very awkward conversation with my father. Um, and so anyway, I say that, I drop that bomb, and then I also back it up to say it's probably the most... It's the best version of that story you could possibly have. My dad did make a mistake in high school. Um, he lived in West Virginia. Um, what you know during that season and time period, as a matter of fact, they didn't no DNA test, no ability to kind of really know for sure. There was questions around the whole situation, um, and it was during that season of time it was like hey if you don't know y'all don't talk y'all can't be in the same room to w with one another and so they literally did not speak you know through the rest of their high school uh, careers and that kind of stuff dad went off to college um in, there in west virginia and his parents actually moved to arkansas after the fact when dad graduated from school he went back into his hometown and was gonna go try to find her and talk to uh talk to her and try to figure out hey Let's, we're adults now, let's talk about this. And when he went back into town, went into this diner and uh, spoke to one of their old mutual friends, and she, they, he was just kind of, you know, just asking questions, poking around, and um, she began to let him know that um, this lady had, was in a serious relationship, actually was married, um, daughter was doing well, things were going all right, and so rather than kind of interject back in there, dad decided, you know what, I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, and so he kind of started rolling out of town. And, and my dad told me that he pulled over on the side of the road that, that, that afternoon and just kind of prayed, God, if, if that is my daughter, if I've got anything to do with this, um, then I pray that you would, one, take care of her, but then also one day bring us, bring us back together type thing. And then that was the end of it from his perspective. Um, later on, um, during, that, during that season, a time period about 10 years ago, my sister had lost in about six in about six to eight years had lost her her mother her grandmother and her grandfather um and so they had all passed away from from cancer or other illnesses and so it led her to begin to try to figure out like more about her family and what she came to find out was that you know about eight years old she found out that her father was not her biological father and her mother pointed out in the yearbook kind of who her dad was and so she grew up thinking her father didn't want anything to do with her. And so here she was years later in her 30s, and she's decided that she was going to reach back out. And the glory of Facebook, uh, she was able to find the people that she was looking for. Uh, and so she was politely writing a letter to my father and letting him know that, hey, uh, I'm going to reach out to my brothers, my younger brother and I, and uh, I'm going to let them know. And so I'm just giving you a heads up. You can tell them or, you know, whatever, but I'm going I'm to reach out to them. And so... Anyway, they began to dialogue back and forth, got to share both sides of the story, got to meet up, got to find out for sure, legitimately, absolutely, she's my older sister. Um, and so we begin the process of kind of this reconciliation. Um, and so for the last 10 years, it's been, it's been an interesting um, ride. Now, my sister lives in North Carolina. Uh, I have a nephew um, who's about the same age as, as my daughter, Tessa. And uh, we all enjoyed a beach trip earlier this summer. Uh, and so it is, it is crazy. It is crazy what kind of curveballs um, life might throw at you uh, and different things. Why in the world do I share with you a story like that this morning? Because I have your attention, right? Stories are powerful. 
stories, they have a way of stirring emotion with inside of us. They have a way of, of grabbing us. And I would say with each one of our lives, story, the, ab- the ability to live out a story, is unavoidable. You are living a story regardless. You, you, you're breathing. You're telling a story. But to live a story that matters requires intention. You have to focus in on some things. And see, story is so powerful, right, that, that we love movies. Or, and, and some of you, you, you really enjoy reading great books. You can dive into it because it, 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 it speaks to you. And, and it's, it's crazy how we're, we're designed that way, to enjoy it. But there again, r- listening or, or being able to read or being able to recognize a great movie, being able to recognize a great story from a book, it doesn't equal living it out, right? It requires intention. It requires us to put forth action. As a matter of fact, in Scripture, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, if you got your Bible with you, turn to Luke 10. Uh, I, want, I want us to look at a story that Jesus tells. It's a very familiar story that you, you've, you know it all. I mean, you know, nearly all of you will know this really well. You know the pieces to this story. But there's some pieces in this dialogue that are just incredibly, incredibly interesting to me. And so in Luke 10, verse 25 is where we're headed. And it goes like this, it says, And behold, the lawyer stood up in front of him to test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So, paint the scene here, right? Many of you you recognize the story, you know know kind of what's going on here, you know where, where we're headed, but let me just encourage you for just a minute to pretend that you hadn't heard this. Pretend that you don't know where we're headed in the Scripture. With your, let me say, the sanctified imagination to just push pause for a minute and, and, and imagine kind of what's going on here. Jesus has entered the scene. Jesus, is, he, he started his public ministry. He's going about, he, he's done some miracles. He's done some healings. He's done some things. And so people are beginning to wonder, is this guy who he says he is? Or is he, is he legitimate? Is he real? Right? And, and there's even some people, right, that have stood up and said, ah, there's no way. Because of where he comes from, because of his background, because of his education, because of who his parents are. Like, he, I mean, really? And what we get is probably a scene where there's at least a small crowd, but there's a crowd here, and and a lawyer steps up, and they knew lawyers back then, similar to we know lawyers out there. You're not a dummy if you're a lawyer for the most part. Um, but, But he's an intelligent guy, right? And so he says, and, and just by the, by the reaction of Jesus, we probably get the tone, because he asked a very legitimate question, right? It's an important question. It's a question that most all of us would like to know. How do I have eternal life? How can I do that? How can I make more than just what's right here and right now? And Jesus says to him, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? Man, intriguing, right? Because this guy asked a very important question, and this is the Messiah standing in front of him. So, so why does Jesus come back with a very vague, let me ask another question approach? Jesus does this from time to time in his ministry, right? And I think because, you know, Jesus is who Jesus is, uh, he knows that the lawyer is not legitimately asking, hey, how do I have you know, eternal life, but more from the standpoint of how can I trip this guy up let me see what he's actually going to tell me so then we can have you know let me you know poke a hole in his armor right here and Jesus in his brilliance turns around and says I don't know you tell me how do you read it and the lawyer responds very very interesting when he says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself Spot on. Good stuff. That's exactly right. Guess what? I honestly believe that Jesus has preached at different times, and, and, and when we see the scripture here, 
right? We, we get enough evidence, and we've got enough evidence in history that, that Jesus, what, what's recorded in Scripture more happened than just what's recorded in Scripture, right? Um, and so Jesus has possibly taught this. I doubt that the lawyer has heard Jesus speak those words. These words that the lawyer responds with are not in the Scripture together. So that tells us a couple of things. The Scripture that he would have known, right? The Old Testament. So, so that tells us a couple of things. Either, either one of two things. He's a brilliant guy, or he had a really brilliant teacher, or both. Because there's a, there's a, a place in Deuteronomy, and there's a place in Leviticus, and he's put these two together. To which later, Jesus actually gives evidence like, yes, this is the greatest commandment. This is, this is, this is it. These two things together. Love people. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Boom. All together right there. So, so the lawyer coming up and saying this, brilliant. Got it. So what's Jesus respond to him? You've answered correctly. That a boy. But here's the kicker. Do this, and you'll live. Mm, eh. But, in verse 29, he says this, But desiring to justify himself, he says to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Right? So there's a little bit of crawfish in there. He's like, ah, I mean, I, really? Who's, but, well, who's my neighbor? I know, I know I'm supposed to, to love my neighbor as myself, but like, like Johnny who lives next door, what's, what does that mean? Let's, let's figure that out. Let's dig a little deeper here. And so Jesus, resp- and, and of course the, the response is, hey, you have to go and do it. You answered right. You have the knowledge. Go do it. And so Jesus gives us this parable that we can learn a lot from. There's lots of pieces here, but let's look at it, a couple, a couple of the, the pieces. And so he says this in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. One of the things Jesus does so great is he stops and he pauses, and he uses something that they would have known very well. The place where Jesus is and where he's speaking and where he's teaching at at these moments, he's he's speaking to a group of people right here in Jerusalem, and they would have known kind of this 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 uh, um, trading fair, this this uh, this road. Um, scholars believe to be known as the Bloody Way, the different the, the, this this uh, track between uh, Jerusalem and Jericho. Lots of overhanging places, lots of places where robbers could hide. And so, as he's speaking and telling this story, the guys who are standing around they they visualize, they see, they understand. Much like if if I was speaking today and I talked about something that was about 15 to 17 miles away from here. And travelers would go back and forth and they would take supplies and they would would go from one town to the other town to either pick up supplies and sell supplies and back and forth. And so Jesus is saying, boom, here's what what happened. There's a man who was going to do this in this process and he gets caught right around that curve, you know, the one that's hanging over and the one that's got the tree that stands right beside it. And so the guys jumped out and they beat him. And so the people can visualize, and it becomes very real what Jesus is talking about. Verse 31. Now by chance, a priest was walking down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite. And when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. When he went to him and bound up his wound, pouring on oil and wine, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave him to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer responds back, and he says this. He says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, again, you go and do likewise. So it's this incredible story and this this scene that's unfolding as Jesus is teaching. And and as many times he does in his ministry, he uses a parable. He uses a story to get through to the people so that they understand. 
exactly what he's trying to talk about. And he uses a very common road and a very common place right here. But there's this guy, and he's coming, and he's got stuff to sell, just like many people do in this area, and they're walking back and forth, and, and he, got, he got caught. And guys beat him up, left him there to die. And along come a priest. And along come a Levite. Now, what's interesting about those two people? Both of those people had more than enough knowledge to know what they were supposed to do in that moment. They, matter of fact, in walking past, not only did they know they should have done something about it, they literally broke the code of conduct in which they lived by in order to walk past him. They broke their own law by walking past him. And then another the next person comes by. And Jesus, <laughs> there's times that I wonder, that, that when I study Jesus, I, I, and especially if you just allow your imagination to play just a little bit, and, and maybe just a little bit of a sanctified imagination. Because when Jesus uses the term Samaritan, right? There, there's, gotta, there's, a little bit of, there's a little dig there, I, I, I think. Because the people that he's talking to, they would not have enjoyed. As a matter of fact, we, I think we even see it in, at the end of Luke 10 right there, uh, at the end of our verses, where, where the lawyer doesn't say the Samaritan, right? He says the one who showed mercy. In other words, I'm not going to tell you Samaritan. Um, but, but, he, but, he, but he lets him know, yeah, the one who showed mercy. But it, it's frustrating to see, yeah, probably the half-breed. Probably the one, you know, that none of us really care for. The one who actually stopped, helped him. It says gave two denarii. I don't know exactly why he gave two. I don't know why that's exactly in the scripture. Other than if we look at the historical context and we look at the area in which he was in, that's about what a guy might have had on him if he is a traitor going back and forth between those two cities. So it's quite possible that that's what he had in his pouch. That's why he gives it and says, hey, listen, I've got supplies. I'm going over here to Jericho. I'll be back through in a couple of days after I sell some of my stuff. When I come back through, if there's more that, that you need in order to, or that you used in order to take care of him, I'll be more than glad to help you out. So in other words, he gave what he had. And what Jesus turns and says is, is this lawyer the entire way, right? The entire time, the lawyer gives the correct answers. And so what's Jesus telling? You're right. Exactly right. Now go and do likewise. Oftentimes, that's one of the most difficult things for us. And, and, and listen, here's what I absolutely need you to understand before I make a few of the other statements is, I am in no way, shape, form, or fashion trying to take away from us learning the Word of God and us absorbing the knowledge that is in this book, of us studying the Word of God. But here's the deal. I know that in a congregation looking across here, if I ask somebody on the back row or if I ask somebody in the middle and, and some of you here in the front, how many hours have sermons have you heard in the last five years, we won't even go your lifetime. In the last five years, we'll even maybe maybe we could even expand that a little bit even more to say how many hours would you might equate to the time period that you've either listened to, read, or heard the word of God or about the word of God. I, there's very few of us in this room that could even remotely start calculating that, right? The answer here is not more knowledge. The answer is you need to start putting into practice what you know to do. And so it's huge. And that's what he's trying to get through to this guy. That's really, in many ways, what Jesus is trying to get through to the Jews, his entire ministry. 
you have an answer. You have the answer right in front of you. I'm the fulfillment of it is what he's trying to let, let them know. But you've actually got to put into practice what you know. So my question to you is, what does that look like for Bethel? What does that look like right here in Paris? If, if, if a group of people this size actually begin to live out their Christianity within their family or within their workplace, I can tell you this, I promise you things don't stay the same one month from now. Things change in a big and radical way. And so I want you to continue to think about that a little bit. I'll, I'll share just a little bit. Specifically, that's one of the things that we're trying to do with students in Fayetteville. And so the guys, uh, I've got just a few things I want to share with you about, like, locally what we're trying to do um, and, and what we do try to do with, um, with our guys on campus and, and just kind of share with you a little bit of that vision. If, if you guys want to click through there. I don't think I have the ability to. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's our idea is to try to equip college students to bring Christ to the world. Um, keep going here. We're, we, may, we may move through them pretty quick. This is a great quote uh, by a guy who's been working with college ministry his entire um, career. But, but the idea that we have college students who have, in many ways, more time and energy than, than so many parts of our, uh, our population. So it's, 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 it's an awesome time period to begin to help just open up their minds as to what God might want to do in and through them, not only on their local uh, campus, but throughout the world. Um, so anyway, you go ahead and shift through there. Did you know that? Do you know there are 120 different nations an hour and a half from here? That's pretty impressive. There again, it's great that we send miss missionaries across the world, but we also have 120 different nations on that campus. And, of course, that ebbs and flows um, from semester to semester, year to year. But that's remarkable because there are students who are being sent here from their countries to learn and be educated in all kinds of different fields, which in most of the world, what that means is when they leave this place with their undergraduate, graduate, doctorate degree, and they head back home, they're going to be industry leaders. And so we got the opportunity to, to do a couple things. One, either introduce them to Christ and change all of eternity for them. But the other thing that, that I think is extremely important, too, is, is help them see what it looks like to follow after Christ on like I used earlier, Tuesday. On a normal day, what does it look like for them to, to live out their faith? Keep rolling right through here. Um, and so biggest thing, I, I think that that way that that works is through personal relationships and working with people um, as much one-on-one -on -one as possible. And so, so some, some of that is trying to get our current students and leaders uh, to step up into leadership and to take ownership of their faith by having coffee conversations, lunch conversations, uh, pulling people aside, playing in them real sports with them, uh, doing what, what they can to build those relationships and in order to engage with them. And so we do all kinds of little things to try to help set that up. Uh, some of it is in, in model form of, of me trying to push them like, for instance, this next semester, um, this next year, uh, we've got a goal of, of trying to contact and share the gospel with 200 people. Um, why, and that's a chart that flows on for the next couple of years. But anyway, why do, why do I come up with those numbers? Why do we try for that? Because I want them to reach their potential. And we believe that Jesus Christ changes people's lives. So if we believe that, then our systems probably ought to back that up. And we probably ought to really push in that direction. And so anyway, go ahead and change that. Of course, Pathway Baptist Church is our, our sponsoring church, and many of you know Jeremy Flanagan. Or, um, anyway, uh, you guys can go ahead and go there. We do that through community groups, um, through um, you know, having students take active roles in leadership, um, and then sharing in Bible study, and then... Um, in accountability throughout um, throughout the weeks, worship and teaching we do that once a week as a kind of as a group come together there on campus and be able to uh, be able to worship 
to be able to uh, to be together um, and and me be able to teach through some specific things, and then through events. This is an interesting thing. I've been in ministry for about ten years. I would say that when I got started, when I got started, I didn't value this part of ministry as much. Let me encourage you something. I, you guys just had VBS. You may have one or two other things, maybe, and then, of course, stuff getting back to school. When people walk in here, what events do is events bring people together, right, to enjoy each other. When people walk in here on a Sunday morning, they can tell if you all love each other or not. And guess what? If you don't love each other, why do you think that they would think that you're going to love them? So when you spend time at a potluck or when you spend time at a cookout or when you spend time coming together, don't undervalue that. That's very essential to what the gospel is. When people, when the people of God love one another, when they take care of one another, that is a huge testimony to the people outside of these walls. And it, of course, shouldn't just stop on the internal. But, but I just want you to know, you need to enjoy each other's presence. You need to have fun with each other. You need to be able to laugh and joke and cut up and, and, and genuinely care about the people within this room. Anyway, you guys go ahead. And this is my family, of course. Uh, Tessa, Enoch, Grayson. Tessa's about to turn eight. And then uh, Enoch's five, about to start kindergarten. Whew. Carrie, about to start kindergarten. Whew. I know. Yeah, I know. We, we, we moved to Fayetteville. Uh, Enoch was six weeks old, and I think Carrie met him right then. So anyway. Anyway, and so then we have some goals and some different things that I need you to be praying about. Um, I need you to be praying about kind of where we are. Um, some different things to, to set up and some different things that we're doing. And, and one of the, you know, the bottom thing that, um, man, is we're trying to increase funds. Uh, that's part of my job, right? Uh, I get to talk and turn around with my students and, and talk to them that nothing can deter us. If we'll follow after God, um, man, we are going to, we're going to make disciples. And that's a beautiful thing, right, about discipleship. That's a beautiful thing about building relationships uh, with, you know, with people is that ultimately, it can be you versus the world, right? There's, no, there's nothing, listen to me, there is nothing stopping you from building relationships with people except you. So, so there's never an excuse there, right? But all of us know that there are times when there are things that can come alongside of us that will help us, correct? And so for us, yeah, part of that is, man, we've, we've seen some, some growth within students, um, and I don't know, anybody driven on campus here lately um, and seen any of the fraternity, sororities, or any of that kind of stuff? Um, Fayetteville's a nice place. It's an expensive place. And so we've got to figure out how to, I've got to figure out how to raise the funding uh, for our ministry in order for us to kind of be able to be there, do things, and um, be able to do more of what we've continued to be doing. So one of the things I've been doing is, one, um, talking to churches and, and, and thanking, them, thanking them for doing what uh, they're doing. But the other thing that we've done here in the last couple of years that we've seen, you started getting traction on, that it's just really been impressive, is for some individuals and families, for you to be thinking about and praying about how you might want to partner with us. Um, and that at all that means that you shouldn't stop uh, giving where you're giving to your local church. But if you've been stopped and you've been thinking about, praying about, figuring out how you might uh, give over and above your tithe and offering, um, I want you to, I want us to talk uh, for us to think about how you might be able to help us um, continue to share the gospel uh, there in Fayetteville. The other thing is for all of these to be praying for how we can reach students on that campus. It's a huge it is a huge mission field and opportunity. So many of the graduates from there are going to go on to be leaders all over the country, uh, all over the state for sure, but with 120 different nations all over the world. And so that's how we are trying to make a difference and an impact. That's how we're trying to live a story with intentionality on our campus. How can this church, how can you as an individual within this body, live a story that matters in this community. 
I promise you this. It can mean a lot of things. It can mean a lot of strategy and talking about it. It's, it that's a struggle worth struggling over. As a church, it's something you ought to be thinking about. You ought to be struggling over. You ought to be debating back and forth and trying to figure out things and, and trying, th- trying things out to figure out how you, how you might reach the people who fall underneath the shadow, shadow of this property. But it starts with this. You've got to be intentional with what you already know to do. And so I'm going to pray over you here in just a second. And what I want you to do this morning is, this is you know a little bit different invitation style possibly, but I want you to do this morning is I want you to, to stand with me and as I pray over you, I want you to be thinking about what is it that I can do to live intentionally right here in this city. Let's stand with me. Let me pray. God, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be in this place. God, I thank you for this church and their, their years of faithfulness. Um, God, what they have meant to the ministry in which I get an opportunity to lead. God, their faithfulness in giving over, the, the, um, over many years, God, has allowed us to have a presence in a very important place. And so, God, I pray that you just continue to, um, to build. God, I pray that you continue to move. But God, I also ask that you'd be with, with this city. And God, particularly this church, as they begin to pray, pray and wrestle and think w- over how can we go and do likewise. God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.